Welcome to Startup Health Now, the weekly webcast that celebrates the healthcare transformers and change makers reimagining healthcare. My name is Unity Stokes, and today we have a conversation with one of my good friends, Jane Sarenson Khan. Uh, Jane is a health economist, a digital health thinker, and author. Uh, we have a wide ranging conversation, so stick around. It's going to be a great show. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. Well, I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the heart. All our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take those who take it. Well, it's great to be here with you, Jane. Thank Always you. lovely to see, see you. you. Uh, so we're at Health 2.0, mm -hmm. ninth year. And you've been here since the beginning. I have. Present at the creation, Matthew and I go back to old days at Institute for the Future. And then when he and Indu started this, they called me and said, we want you to be on our advisory board. And you're still uh, on the advisory board. And I'm board. still advising and helping bring in folks and identify potential panelists, et cetera. So this has been a great year. Mm. Chelsea Clinton was here. The Surgeon awesome. General's here. Yeah. A lot of amazing startups are here. Yeah. We've got a bunch of startup health companies here. Yeah. Um, you know what? What are you excited about? What have you noticed this mm. year that that really stands out as maybe some some big themes? Mm -hmm. This year, I think we're getting real, realistic, uh, pragmatic about. Uh, the new, new thing. So it's not new, new thing of technologies in search of a problem. We know what the problems are. We spend too much money on health care. We're not driving quality through in the United States. This is a very U.S.-centric uh, argument I'm making because I know we have a global audience. Right. Um, so the issue of what's this triple aim, which is our operational beacon in America. Let's drive population health. Let's improve the patient experience, make it more as as I said yesterday on my CEO interview, more Nordstrom-like, more Amazon-like. It's not just Uber, but we have to remember the mainstream in mm -hmm. America is not driving in Uber. So consumerized, They're, but consumer for every consumer. Consumer for the mass. Because if we can move the needle on health in that middle of the middle, people who shop at Walmart and Target or Costco, and not just people in the outlying areas uh, who are either Silicon Valley or affluent people, we move the needle on health, costs, quality, and it's, uh, you know, the holy grail. Do you so think that's really why we're that. seeing companies like Walmart become health companies? Yeah. So there's this big shift I've seen in the last few years that my business at Think Health, we're, uh, our portfolio of clients has really changed from just serving legacy health providers, hospitals, health plans, pharma, biotech, to working with consumer-facing companies. I have two big food clients, one European, one American now, uh, working with uh, consumer electronics companies, the kinds of which show at the Consumer Electronics Show and at South by Southwest, working uh, increasing, increasingly with technology companies. And because of this shift of the consumer caring more uh, for themselves and the consumer trusting retail, pharmacy, grocery stores, at least as much as they trust the healthcare providers to help them with health. And what's driving that is transparency of price and quality. As people are paying more out of pocket, mm -hmm. they get greater transparency going to Amazon to get a pack of diapers that they might then they might even get when at, at Walgreens where the price might might not be there. I mean, there's a big study that I've been quoting a lot and I think this will concentrate the minds and I've been using this a lot in my talks to like the hospital associations lately. This is a data point that's stunning. Um, found in a booze uh, Booz Allen now, it's called Strategy And, which is part of PwC, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But the study came out last November, consumer study, which found 39% uh, of U.S. consumers trust healthcare providers to help them manage their health. Okay, so the question is, who do you trust to help you manage your health? 39% of people said health providers, 40% 
said large retail, and and 39% said digitally enabled companies. So let me say this wow. one more time for listeners because this is hard to believe, but it's true. And I've been using this a lot in these arguments to hospitals to say, you're losing. Um, as many people trust big retail, Walmart, Target, Costco, health providers, and digitally enabled companies, Amazon, Uber, to do, say, delivery of, farm, of prescriptions, um, uh, digitally enabled companies, Apple, Google. So now hospitals and doctors have to behave more like retail and digital companies. What does that say? When you look at one of the charts in the Booz, uh, I keep calling them Booz Allen, strategy we'll, we'll and We'll put a link in, study. in the uh, I'll show give notes. you the link, okay. uh, and I'll give you the slide that we can you can incorporate into the video if you'd like, because you see these bars that say um, for top 40%, retail, health providers, and digitally enabled companies. What that means is consumers are looking for price transparency and the ability to get their arms around what is the value proposition for the product, right. the product which is health and health care. And the thing is, with either the charge master, meaning the non-transparent billing processes at hospitals, or doctor's charges where you get an EOB next week that says, that you don't understand, that says the health insurer will pay 50% of blah, blah, blah. It's an unsustainable system. So what would your advice be to, to industry, let's call it legacy healthcare industry, yeah. maybe hospital systems, mm -hmm. insurance companies, mm -hmm. who for decades have basically not been communicating to consumers mm -hmm. uh, the way consumers are used to being communicated mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Um, is it a lost cause for them? Is mm -hmm. there is anything that they can be doing? What mm -hmm. advice do you have? Yeah, it's not a lost cause if you start to get it and you start to take this retail health world seriously. What's changed everything in the mind of the consumer is this new high deductible health plan coupled with a health savings account. All of a sudden, when you go to consume healthcare services and utilize them, you are now the payer until you meet your deductible. Well, so, that so knowing the price of something matters. You must know the price <laughs> of it because you want to manage your eight health savings account with your over-the-counter drugs, your prescription drugs, and your visits to hospital or to doctors if you're a well person. Um, you still need to pay a copay, uh, maybe the whole price of a visit. So you want to know. Or uh, one of the most um, common things that people you know, who are attending this conference might have is a sports, a sports injury of a knee, say, that needs an arthroscopy. You can now find bundled payment with a, an orthopedic surgeon where it's all in for X amount of dollars. If you look at, say, Pocket Doc, or mm -hmm. you go to one of the other online healthcare shopping marketplaces. These are very separate from the health system. Mm -hmm. Hospitals don't tend to participate in these things, but a growing legion of doctors who are entrepreneurial are, particularly surgeons in dermatology or dentists, mm -hmm. where you, ha you can do a bundled payment right. uh, for a product, which is called arthroscopy right. or shoulder surgery, something like that. So the more we can productize these services and give people a price, not a price for the surgery, a price for the anesthesiologist, a price for the bed, a facility fee for the ambulatory surgery center. Where it's all broken Rehab, into a million things million and you're trying pieces, to figure out what you're paying for. 12 EOBs, explanations mm -hmm. of benefits, which you can't decipher. Even I have trouble sometimes. Right. And I mean, I'm an economist married to a banker. If <laughs> I can't, if we can't figure this out and we're not, we don't have any chronic conditions, right. but just the regular stuff, right. going to the dentist, it's crazy making. Well, what about, so so price transparency, critical. Critical. What about this concept of, of design? Mm -hmm. So, for example, you walk into an Apple store. Mm -hmm. It's just a delightful experience. Mm -hmm. You take an Uber, and, of course, yes, everybody doesn't take it, but when, once you do, you kind of don't want to take a regular taxi oh, anymore. Oh, that's for sure. Um, you go into many hospitals, as an example, and it's it's kind of a miserable experience mm -hmm. just in terms of design, yeah. um, let alone the, the reason you're probably there isn't going to be a good one. Yeah. Um, 
How does that factor into this consumer relationship mm -hmm. and maybe the companies that are um, going to win in the future in terms of, of health mm -hmm. innovation? Yeah, I mean, design is central and a key competence that the health industry really needs to adopt. The health industry needs to take a page out of those companies that have user-centered design, not patient-centered design, but consumer-centered design, because that patient is first a person. Mm. And so, you know, if you're designing a facility for maternity, which is uh, a key area that hospitals want to capture, because once you capture a young mom in a maternity setting and you've delighted and enchanted her and her family, you have a customer for life mm -hmm. if she stays in that market. Mm -hmm and doesn't move elsewhere. So that's been an early sort of um, vanguard move that a lot of health systems are starting to get and working with sharp interior designers and experience-centered designers to design an, a delightful experience for young women, women who are having babies. Mm -hmm. um, that's where it could start if you're stepping into this user design world. But it really needs to start from the moment somebody enters your facility area where you park the car. Mm -hmm. Is there a valet? Is it free parking? Um, a lot of medical schools in urban areas where you might have to go for really dire care, desperate care, uh, tertiary mm -hmm. specialist care. You're driving into an urban area. It's a miserable drive to get there. The parking is never free. Mm -hmm. You have to pay in addition to paying for, of course, ridiculously expensive mm -hmm. services. So from the beginning, if you think like a hotelier and the 360 degrees that, say, Conrad Hilton thought about when he designed hotel hotels from the minute you park all the way through the whole 360 degree experience, if you can start impacting the, co the consumer experience in the hospital setting, as you're mentioning, um, you can start to be so, more consumer centric. So, so do you think it's more likely that um, a hospital system gets it and starts to become more like Apple, mm -hmm. or let's flip it around, in Apple or Google, ends up owning hospitals and reinventing the entire experience, mm -hmm. or it could be a new startup who hasn't even emerged yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Apple and Google will ever want to be in the hospital business <laughs> because the bed, the business of beds is dying in a way because we can do so much virtually. So I do a lot of speaking to the hospital associations this year. I'm kind of a flavor for bringing uh, the message of the new consumer to hospitals, which they're ready to hear. I'm happy to say. And I've that's spoken a big change. In Utah, yeah, I've spoken in Wisconsin and Arkansas. I'm going all over the country to different markets, all of whom are saying, Jane, talk to us about this new retail health in the consumer. So the, the good news is they're listening. Mm. Now it's will they take action. Uh, and I think they mean to if they can get their boards. Uh, hospitals are very political places sure. on economic entities. But the question every hospital now has to ask themselves is, what is the future uh, of a hospital look like because it won't look like a, a hundred beds, five hundred beds, be twelve hundred beds, or, wh or where the person health, is. Health. I have been writing for a few years now. The medical home is the person's home, the true medical home, not the physician office. The primary care, I believe, you should have a medical home that way, a doctor. But a lot of millennials don't believe they need a mm -hmm. primary a PCP mm -hmm. going forward. They'll use American Well or another telehealth kind of doctor. So we're seeing or Google a or their phone. Yeah. Google the phone and app. So we're seeing the virtualization of healthcare mm. where it can be virtual. And I like, as a health economist, that's you know how I think, I like virtualization when it makes sense, when it's not acute and you need to have auscultation and sure. palpation uh, and actually touch a patient. But most dermatology can now be done through taking a picture of skin, dermis, and doing telehealth. Um, is it uh, a cold sore? Is it herpes doctor? Yeah. Or is it a, a cancerous mole? Mm -hmm. Come into my office, Jane. Right. It doesn't look good. And or, that can be, be the difference of life and death if, if 
someone doesn't have access to a derm That's right away. That's right. And in rural <clears throat> areas right. or uh, highly urban areas where derms mm -hmm. might not be ex available in terms of a same-day appointment, that could really be yeah. uh, a fantastic thing. So we're looking at how can we do virtual health care, not in a bed and not on Pill Hill, where it could be very expensive and time taking to get to. And I think that will help us help save us uh, in some ways in terms of bending the cost curve and expanding access. So the bed, this future of the hospital becomes an interesting question. And every metropolitan area will have different issues to wrestle with in terms of what's the appropriate number of beds to have, in terms of the supply side in a market, how much competition is there. Uh, the questions are quite strategic and serious mm. uh, for these hospitals that I talk to. So what are some of the the areas of innovation you're most excited about? We're, we're doing a, a, a big new partnership with GE Ventures, yes. focusing on virtual health, which we yeah. were just talking about, and also payment solutions, mm -hmm. um, sort of the backbone of, of a lot of health care. Um, I know you've written a lot about the the Internet of Things mm -hmm. as it applies to, to care. What are yeah. some of the areas that you're most excited about and where you see things really evolving mm -hmm. and developing? Mm -hmm. The opportuni ultimate opportunity, I think, with Internet of Things is um, – goes back to the mantra, health is where we live, work, play, and pray, and go to school, I've added, because okay. I'm really thinking a lot now that our daughter is in, um, not your daughter, and not your and my daughter, but my husband's and my daughter, um, is in a sophomore at college, down at SCAD, at Savannah. And what's interesting is to see what is her new health dynamic, not at our house. She's got her own health dynamic on a college campus, and a, you know, a, a small city college campus. Um, so she's taking advantage of a lot of apps. She's taking advantage of CVS Minute Clinic. She's taking advantage of school health services. She's got a whole lot of, a whole roster of, of a supply side mm. to have. But the biggest issue a lot of our young people are dealing with is behavioral health issues, mental health issues. And we have to start bundling that in terms of overall health and wellness. Because people define, people, consumers, define health, we learned in the 2008 Edelman Health Engagement Parameter, the first one, first physical health, then mental and emotional health, then my physical appearance. If I look good, I feel better. And finally, 80% of people said my financial health. This is all about your well-being, your whole life. Whole life. So health where we live, work, play, pray, and go to school. And what that means is we want to touch people in healthy ways everywhere, mm -hmm. at the workplace, where we shop, in the car, mm -hmm. so the connected car in the Internet of Things world becomes very important. Um, if you, if the car app knows that you have asthma or COPD and you're driving with the windows open and all of a sudden the propeller um, health-like sensor in the car senses the air quality sucks for you and you may, it may exacerbate an incident, an asthmatic incident or other respiratory thing, then the windows shut, the air conditioning comes on, and you avert a disaster. Yeah. The car knows. I, I just wrote a, a column for Forbes about how I think the car could be the next big platform for and digital I health. And I saw that. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, I'm just so excited by that. So this is very interesting. I'd love to dig in with you on um, how startups and emerging entrepreneurs, young companies, um, what they should be doing, what they should be focusing on to really leverage these opportunities and these trends we've been talking about. Do you have any words of wisdom, um, either practical or, or just suggestions for what they should be focusing on today? Solve problems, solve real problems, look at real people, go to Walmart, go to the shopping mall, go to the park, watch people, be an anthropologist, figure out, you know, talk to your grandparents, talk to people who have disabilities in your life, talk to people with mental health challenges in your life. There's a um, new book out this week by Patrick Kennedy, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy's son, where he's coming out 
to talk about the mental health issues in his family. And some of his family members are very unhappy because they were all keeping the secret as if nobody knew, which we mm -hmm. all knew from news articles in the Boston Globe and such, that the family had many mental health challenges, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, mm -hmm. et cetera, marital uh, maybe sex addiction, who knows? Um, the Kennedy family has a whole host of things that they've been dealing with for years. I bring this up because the taboo of mental health has to stop. Mm -hmm. And this is part and parcel of whole health. So people, everybody has some mental health something in their family. Everybody's got cancer in their family. Mm -hmm. Everybody has people who are LGBT in their family, or if you don't think you do, you do and you just don't know it statistically. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are lots of health issues that LGBT popul that the LGBT population is dealing with, uh, mental health, other issues, because of the stigma that's in all of these things. So we have to solve real problems, and we have to get, and I have a public health degree in addition to my economics degree. We've got to all, if in this startup world, think like public health people. What are the sober, tough problems? We have enough tools out there to help the well affluent population right, right. forever and right. half and ever. Um, my new report for California Healthcare Foundation is looking very soberly, and uh, my research is not happy, um, and not sanguine, I should say, uh, digital health for the underserved. Hmm. I'm getting serious about this issue because the real problems are that so many people still have sort of basic phones. And we right. talk about building for Android and for iOS, but in fact still, even if somebody has a smartphone, they can't afford the data plan. Right. So we thinking get about real. the design about about, hey, does this eat up an entire month's worth of data the, just by the, using the it? The living. Know the problem you're going to solve and how that person lives. What's their workflow? What is their budget? Who's going to pay? Mm -hmm. You've got to figure out the business model along with the person's life flow. And what problems are they trying to solve? If you look at it from that, that that's true consumer demand. When you look at the person, how they live, what are the problems? If you can solve that problem and do it at a price somebody is willing to pay, or you were talking about what are the pricing mechanisms, a health plan, um, the more risk that providers take on in terms of bundled payment, paying for performance in the value-based world instead of the volume world, all of a sudden you can go to Verizon and say, I'm going to cut a deal with you, Verizon, to get data plans for 50 bucks a month per member per month, because if I can get a data plan to this group of pediatric uh, kids with asthma, keep them out of the ER right. once a month, that pays for itself. We have to start thinking about what do we wrap around the technology in terms of the social determinants of health. So maybe more more focus on on business model. There's a, there's a lot of great technologies here, but mm. more more focus on experience, user experience, mm -hmm. design, and and business model. Mm -hmm. um, are you, you know, in, in your view, is it more important to nail that business model from the beginning, or or focus on solving the problem and the outcomes, worry about the business model later. And I've seen, you know, a, a lot of different arguments on, on this mm -hmm. concept. Mm -hmm. w what are your thoughts there? Um, I think there are two parallel tracks, both important. Find the problem you want to solve. Uh, that, there has to be the light bulb moment of right. what is my passion in terms of the problem I want to solve. Once you have a general idea of the problem you want to solve and you have the fire in the belly, because yeah. that's what it's going to take for the sustaining that process, then you have to figure out fairly quickly, in general terms, but is there a business model here? And there could be many. As we move from volume to value and payment, there will be more business models because there will be the financial incentives mm -hmm. for that legacy healthcare system who's taking on the financial risk to think about getting the fridge for Mrs. Jones so yeah. she can eat healthy, right? Yeah, wonderful. So uh, got some, uh, some fun questions for you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Kennedy's book earlier. Um, do you have any books that you recommend, could be books or blogs, that you recommend to 
health innovators, um, could be on the industry side or the startup side. Mm -hmm. So this year, everyone's gone crazy happy about Eric Topol's book, The Patient Will See You Now. So with that, I did um, a book review of three books uh, a few months ago that everyone should read at the same time. Okay. So you read Eric Topol's book. That's sort of the techno-optimist book. And then today, Bob Wachter, an old friend of mine for over 30 years, spoke about uh, the, being a digital doctor, the digital doctor. You go from Eric Topol to Bob Wachter, who kind of is the techno pragmatist, and then you read Atul Gawande's uh, being mm -hmm. um, human, being mortal, being mortal, being human, about end of life mm -hmm. and the humbling of Dr. Gawande, and you put those three together, and you kind of get it right because um, Eric's book, we need to know what the future is. R Bob's book, we need to know what the present one, three year term is. And Gawande, we need to keep in mind um, our moral compass mm -hmm. about being human and being loving mm -hmm. and generous and how end of life really humbles all of us. Mm -hmm. And we've got to stay humble. Yeah, absolutely. And also maybe spending time, like you said, um, just as, you know, watching people and, and being out there, especially in underserved uh, parts of the world where mm -hmm. maybe there's no access to, to any care. You know, uh, the other book to read is one I, that goes back to my business school reading days at University of Michigan, uh, C.K. Prahalad, who sadly passed away a few years ago, uh, excellent business school professor at University of Michigan, my alma mater. And he wrote a book called, and it's still very relevant, it's over 20 years old, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Because you think about a pyramid and the bottom is very broad. And he wrote about, say, the emerging economy in India. And this is a volume play. This is how Walmart makes a living, serving the mass. Mm -hmm. If you could play a, a big volume game at a low price, you can make a fortune. Mm -hmm. So we think about technology for the underserved. Play at that margin and scale. Yeah, I, it, it, it's amazing to me. You, you take something like um, a very expensive remote monitoring device yeah. that may be hundreds of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. um, and you rethink the business model, you rethink the technology, mm -hmm. put it on a phone or, or, or something that could literally serve maybe six billion people yeah. or seven billion people yeah. and the opportunity completely changes That's right so mobile people health. get more access mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. wonderful um well this has been a absolutely wonderful conversation we got to do this you. more yes. um where can people learn more about you i know you got a wonderful blog thank um you. where should people look look for you on the sure. interwebs sure thank you yes i'm all over the interwebs okay. which is why we organized all of me online under my name at janesaracencon.com um and the place you can actually find that because my name's hard to spell is first at the blog health populi health p-o-p-u-l-i dot Okay. That's the blog, janesaracencon.com, no hyphen in there. And my Huffington Post columns, you can go to HuffPo and search on my name, my many California Healthcare Foundation papers. Um, and then I write a lot and yeah. speak a lot elsewhere. And I'm a huge fan of uh, Startup Health and the Steve and Unity show because um, you guys well, are it's really, really a helping whole, transform. It's a whole community and, and Absolutely. You know, it's been so fun. Um, to know you over the years. It's great to be here the ninth year at, at yeah. Health 2.0. It's great, the ecosystem that's that's really yeah. emerged here. Um, so one, one last question for you. If you could sort of activate the, the audience here to, to do anything, one ask from, from you, what, what would that ask be? For the startup community? Startup community, just the innovation ecosystem around health, wellness, health care. It's get real and solve real problems and stop building the same old, same old. We have more than enough of these things for those on the podcast. I'm pointing to my Jawbone Up 24 that I love, and I just bought the up the um, Jawbone Up 3. But we don't need any more wear, wearables of this type. Right. We need real things, and we don't want to wear anything anymore. We want to have a, an Internet of Things seamless, Invisible seamless experience. Invisible in our life. Tattoo, baby. Yeah. Put uh, it on my skin. Well, well, thank you so much. It's been great to see <laughs> Thanks, you. Thanks, Unity. Well, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.